Anthony, thanks for being on here. Known you for a long time. And so just excited to talk to you today. I wanted to kick it off maybe just for people that don't know who you are. Um, and even those that do, um, I, I always like to ask the question, like what's not on your resume that you think people should know about? If, is there anything, cause like if you can look up your bio on any of the sites that you're a part of, but like, is there something that you're personally, that's impacted you in a way that's like, man, this is something people don't know about, about me that that's meaningful and, and important. Thank you for having me on. That's that's a comp that's a complex question. There 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 Start are off so many one, Anthony. I mean, come on. You got to, you know. Well, there there's so many there's so many different avenues uh that I I could probably go down to answer that question. I think I think maybe maybe what's what's not in the in the bios um is is probably the what what motivates the sort of work that I do. And won't communicate, but I'm, I'm primarily interested in, in how people connect with each other and what happens when, when connection goes bad and when disconnection uh, really gets evil. Mm. And so much of what I see in terms of our culture, the world in general, is the degradation of connection. And I'm interested in, in how we can reestablish that, improve that, and rescue people from not just disconnection, but disconnection that, that goes that goes evil. So that really, I think that's probably the sort of the, the subtext behind behind everything else that that people won't probably notice. But if you are aware of that, it'll it should help people, I hope connect some of the dots in, in terms of the random uh, uh, sets of topics that I tend to, to talk about. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, the subtext uh, behind yeah. all of those. Is there, cause I imagine, well, and I, and I know you personally, but I'm sure there's a subtext behind the subtext. Are there a couple of moments, whether it's college and it's, or even seminary or some other things where it's like, you know what, I, I didn't connect here or I struggled to connect or I, I felt a, a sense of isolation or loneliness. And so therefore this, this notion of connection is something that's, that's overlooked. Um, is there anything in your life where like that kind of drew, drew you to this, this, this idea of connection? Yeah, I think, I think so, so much of my post middle school life has been, has been, I think one narrative might be um, attempts to resolve my own sense of, of disconnection mm -hmm. and trying to sort out um, at least at least my own perception sort of self-perception is is why is it that it seems that um, that other people struggle with it and some are successful at it and why is it depending on the context that I myself uh, seem to be on the outside uh, rather than on the inside of of connection. Um, you know, sort of beginning in. I think I think I think my high school experience is probably the, the most profound one because I was sort of on the fringe. Uh, you know, this is the '80s, right? So you had the kind of cliques of like the cool kids, the jocks, the nerd, all those. Sort of, and I, I never really fit into any one of those particularly. And so I was, I just sort of bounced around and never had a sort of social home. Hmm. And I spent a lot of years in college really doing the same thing, kind of bouncing around uh, these different communities, never really feeling a sense of, 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 a, of a social home until my, really my senior year at, at, at Clemson. And so it's been, I'm curious about my own story there. And then what happened is as soon as I started getting involved in ministry, I noticed, I discovered that I was not alone in this. And this is maybe an epidemic, especially when I started doing a lot of youth ministry <laughs> while I was in seminary. Yeah. yeah. And so I think a lot of you are, so I know you kind of through, through church work and different things like that, but, but your work kind of spans this, this really interesting breadth. I mean, you have a master's in, in criminology. Um, you have a, a master's in, in theology, you have a PhD in theology. Um, 
talk to me about this idea of, of personalism. Cause I think one of the things that I think is really fascinating about you and your perspective on issues like mass incarceration is you, you really bring it back to this issue of personalism. Can you maybe define that for us and kind of talk a little bit about personalism? Yeah. Uh, uh, personalism is a, a category in, in Christian social thought it should have emerged after World War I. And it's a way of thinking about uh, public policy non-ideologically. So what we want to do in the personalist framework is to think about policies from the person up rather than from the ideology down or from the perspective down. And, and essentially, one way to think about it is this. Uh, given, given the attributes of what it means to be human, given what it, given what it means to be a person, all of the, the privileges and opportunities and expectations that are associated with being a human being, one's freedom, one's intellect, one's creativity, the opportunities to love and to be loved, community connection, all of those things that make a person a person. How should we be thinking about policy and society and structures from the person up? from those attributes up so that people who are, who are made in, in, in God's image can actually live and be truly human. So it's a, it's a way of, of sort of humanizing how we think about uh, uh, public policy rather than saying, I believe in this ideology X, Y, and I want to impose that on this community. Hmm. Or uh, I disagree with this pr pr uh, perspective X, Y, and I want to remove it from the, this, uh, this community. What does it mean to think about what do people actually need and, and, and what sorts of structures politically, economically, socially are necessary for people to be truly human and thrive and flourish? And this emphasis on the human person is something that really uh, captivated uh, Martin Luther King when he was studying at Boston University and was a major catalyst and a category uh, for the civil rights movement. And so you, you would see signs during the movement that said, I am a man. And, and the invitation was that America should treat African Americans according to their humanity. Hmm. Right. It was also very influential in, in Pope John Paul II's papacy um, primarily, uh, especially in, in the 70s and, and, and uh, 80s, within within his 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 own his own writing and and, and context, and it, it really this emphasis on on the centrality of the human person really gave a lot of the conceptual frameworks for uh, the pro life movement mm -hmm. as well, particularly coming out of the uh, uh, 70s and, and and 1980s. So so my interest really is I'm, I'm interested in in having sort of non-partisan, non-ideologically driven solutions to deeply troubling social questions by thinking about what people actually need yeah. uh, rather, than ra rather than simply waving a flag about one's ideology being right or wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong then, um, when we look at over-criminalization, from your perspective then, it's, it's not so much Overcriminalization is the problem. It's overcriminalization is the result of uh, bad policy, bad ideology, or ideology that's driven decision making throughout the decades, if not centuries. Um, that has, in, in effect, dehumanized people in society. Uh, and so, therefore, we're left with overflowing prison system that's just been on a skyrocket in the last 20, 30 years. Can you talk to me a little bit about the can you give us a picture from your perspective? What's the history, you know, of, of criminalization in America from your perspective? How, in some level, how did we get to where we are today, where we're having this conversation and you see things like Van Jones and the second chance movements and, and um, a lot of like reactions to um, decriminalizing certain offenses and recognizing that the war on drugs was probably not a good thing. Um, these ideologies, as you say, that have driven a lot of the decision-making. Can you give us a picture, like a, a snapshot of history sure. to this point? 
Yeah, you know, most people are probably not aware that our our penitentiary system was created, sort of uh, catalyzed, initiated, uh, uh, designed by the Quakers. So it was primarily first a Christian institution. The first penitentiary was a, was a Quaker one. And, and it was an attempt to take people who have sort of broken the social contract, to put them in a place, to hold them, that they can reflect on their public offense and be restored back to, <clears throat> back to community. They might, they might repent and, and, be, and be restored. Uh, that was in the early 18th century. And, and as we in the West, and I mean in the UK and here in the US, uh, as, as we in the West divorce the sort of Christian foundation from the framework of why we would punish people, uh, uh, incapacitation became more of the driving force behind uh, uh, policing and incarceration. Now, if you look closely at American history, what you'll find is that we've used the criminal justice system and policing and incapacitation uh, primarily to control poor people. And that's been really the, the anthropological uh, uh, issue is that we use the state, we use policing, we use jails and prisons to manage the poor. And one of the things that we've seen over the history of this country is using criminal laws to manage poor people and to use criminal sentencing primarily to manage poor people. And so part of my question is, is, that, is that why is it that we are using those mechanisms uh, to manage the poor rather than using other institutions in civil society uh, to help uh, reduce criminal activity, uh, to keep the peace, uh, et cetera. So when you look at the history of, of spikes in in incarceration, there's one population that we tend to focus on and, and that's, that's the poor. And what's happened in this country is that we sort of ebb and flow in terms of the, the, those lower class people that we deem to be particularly more dangerous than others. Uh, one theorist calls them sort of rabble, right? So who, who are the rabble in, in society? Well, before World War II, the rabble were, were sort of non-English Im immigrants. Mm -hmm. So if you were looking at, at most major cities, we, tend, we, we had a tendency to over-police immigrant communities, right? Scots-Irish communities and Italian communities, uh, Greek communities, uh, Germans, Polish, et cetera. I mean, those were the sort of communities that were policed. And what happened, this, tr this transition kind of happened in the 50s through the, the 60s, is that the, the urban areas which used to house uh, East, sorry, uh, Western European immigrants for the most part, began to house African Americans. And those same communities that were over-policed, those same communities that were, that was sort of uh, uh, over-managed by the criminal justice system, began to overmanage and overcriminalize the new residents of those communities, uh, which were African Americans. And then we moved into the 70s and, be and began to see some of those uh, spikes that sort of drove itself into the mid 1990s. And, and so from my perspective, if I look behind the racial discourse, what I see are real class disparities there. Because the black middle class, for example, in the 70s and 80s, uh, were no less punitive than sort of white suburban uh, decision makers in, in major metro areas as well. So we have this, we have this, this uh, contempt about poor people that really drives how we apply and even write uh, criminal laws. So, so what does a path forward look like? So I, I think the work that you're doing around uh, the person up versus the ideology down, uh, this idea of connection. What are some of the things that you're seeing um, that would actually move us to, to a place where the criminal justice system is restorative, is helpful, is part of the fabric of society that's, that's healthy and allows for the flourishing people? What does that look like? And is there, are there pockets of that anywhere that you're, that you're seeing? 
Absolutely. That's, that's, I, I have a, a couple of chapters in my book that really focus on, on states that are doing really good things and also lots of nonprofits in the country that are, that are really doing phenomenal things. And, and for me, the big question is, in terms of moving forward, is, is what do we do to prevent people from entering into the criminal justice system in the first place? Right? Not, I, I don't think it's helpful to sort of talk about only restructuring the system, which needs to happen, or only working on reentry issues. But, but why do people commit crime in the first place? Right? Why, why does criminal deviance even exist? And how do we keep people from being criminally deviant uh, uh, in a way that actually humanizes them rather than treating them like animals to be controlled? Mm. Or statistics, and, yeah, numbers on some Exactly, ground. exactly. And so if you look at the data, and, and this is not, you know, th this, it's, it's kind of an aha moment for some people because they're not, they might not be aware of this, but and for others, it's going to be, well, well duh. Uh, but if, if you look at the data, uh, because most, uh, most of the, the prison population in, in, in jails and prisons and states are men, in most states, it's going to be anywhere from 93 to probably 96, 7% is going to be men we tend to find is that that men who commit crime tend to come from uh, broken broken homes and that's that's not race specific so so criminal deviance has a lot to do with the family and the ways in which uh, boys are nurtured by their fathers and so much of the interventions that I'm interested in are, are, are ways to strengthen institutions like marriage and family, because those are the things in the long term that uh, undermine and destroy criminal deviance. Uh, here's what you're not going to find usually in a prison is a man who had a father uh, who was affectionate with him, uh, who gave him good boundaries, who taught him uh, virtues, uh, who loved him deeply, spent time with him, uh, taught him how to be a virtuous man, and included him in his relationships with his, with his adult, you know, peer friends. I had a mother who was very nurturing and supportive and, and really introduced him into communities of adults that really loved and cared for him and invested in him. Uh, it, that's not the profile of a, of a person that ends up in prison. That's the profile of a person that ends up being an entrepreneur, uh, mm -hmm. often ends up being uh, certainly going to college, uh, who is, is someone who becomes uh, a man who, who makes a contribution to the common good. So I I want to I want to go upstream even further than changing criminal laws, uh, further than simply thinking about uh, reentry issues, and really really undermining the existence of, of criminal deviance. Yeah, it's interesting. We we've talked about like this analogy of like a bathtub and some of the work that we've done, where it's overflowing and we're we're running around with buckets trying to hold the water at bay and. Uh, and what we need to do is work to also turn off the spigot. We need to reduce the flow in. And it's not that both, both aren't important and we don't need to put resources in both directions, but if we can really reduce the, uh, the issues, the criminal deviance, as you, as you say, yeah. um, we're going to see kind of a, a nice um, community. Um, I do have a question, though. As you talk about um, this idea of, of targeting or controlling poor people, where in the idea of uh, criminal deviance and this, this idea of family, where does, where does economics fit into that? And so it's, it's you know, it, on some levels, there is, there is a race component there, uh, you know, as you and I have talked about, just because of just decades, if not centuries, of unbelievable wealth inequality uh, because of institutions like slavery and, and institutions like Jim Crow. So how does the economic factor, what are those factors that you've started to identify in, in what keeps families together how much of it is an economic decision how much of it is a 
an education decision? Like what goes into the deconstruction of the home that we're, we're seeing uh, in our culture? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so, so much of it has to do with the sort of basic psychology of the way men think. And it's really this simple. Uh, when, when, when men have uh, sustainable employment with a pathway and projection and expectation of advancement and opportunities to increase their knowledge and skills, uh, they tend to uh, get married and, and invest in their children. It's, it's really just that simple. The guy needs a job and he needs a good job. He doesn't need, he, he doesn't need a super wealthy job, but he needs a good job where he can foreseeably uh, provide for himself and for his children. Those are the things that tend to motivate men to get married. And I've always been curious about you know, some, some who say, well, they should just get married. I'm like, well, do you understand how men think? Some men won't get married because they feel inadequate about their capacity to provide for a family hmm. because they don't have a good job, right? And so when they have a great job, when, when, and when it's a, when, when, I, when I say great job, I don't mean simply, you know, sweeping and picking up leaves, right? But when he, when he has a job that's challenging, that's humanizing, where he's learning and growing, uh, those are the sorts of things that also motivates men to invest in the women they're dating, to marry them, uh, to want to set up a family and a, and a home. And it's not, it's not, it's not pride. It's, I, I would say it's, it's pride in the good sense of, 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 of recognizing that I am, I'm a provider, I'm a caretaker, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Right? And when men don't have sustainable employment, they're less likely to see themselves that way. And what happens is that it tends to undermine uh, their commitments to, uh, to the women that they're involved with and their, and their children. That's a really, really simple, really, really important variable that often gets, gets missed. And, and I've, I've worked with lots of, of working class men over the years in inner cities. And you ask them, hey, do you love her? Yes. Do you love these kids? Yes. And he may be living with them even. Right? But why don't you get married? Well, I can't afford an engagement ring. What? Why don't you want to get married? Oh, I can't afford a wedding. What? Why don't you get married? Well, I'm kind of in between jobs and yada, yada, yada. So I think, I think there's, there's, something about, there's something about the design of men where we're being situated in a very good employment uh, context is really the birthplace of, of a lot of, of mature decisions that tends to stabilize and maintain families. So then let's, let's take that into kind of the workplace. Um, you know, there's, there's great resources. So like um, the company Cadbury, if, you, if you've studied history, which I know you're a student of history, just how they built their, they, basically a town around their company. People needed workforce housing. They built it. They provided pensions before that was even a thing. Same with Guinness, right? So there's some, some historic big brands uh, there are current day brands. There are cu current day companies that are really looking at this idea of making profit and providing for, and really considering the kind of the, the true value, the true purpose of business. W what do you think happened um, in, 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 in business to where we, we reduced the, the role of business to profit? Like the bottom line of business is money and to maximize profit for shareholders, i.e. the investors, which is, again, I'm, we're, I don't think we would say profit's bad, but where that becomes the only purpose and all of a sudden the decisions you make around people, around community, around your workforce and opportunities, um, it starts to shift. And is there a moment or, or, or have you, do you, as a, in American history or Western history, where we, we as, a, as a culture started to kind of gravitate away from this idea of business that had other than profit purposes? That's a, I, that's a, that's a fantastic question. 
I, I'm not an expert in this area uh, to say definitively, however, uh, my, my conjecture has a lot to do with our, our overemphasis on growth that emerged during the progressive era, where, where um, a growing business is what you wanted, hmm. right? And you want it to not have one location, but three or four or five or six or seven. And what's interesting is that as we focus on, on shareholder value and growth, those, those businesses were, uh, became increasingly disconnected from their communities as seeing themselves as members of their communities. So, so much of what you said is, is, it is a burden for these multinational, right? So the, the large corp. I think most small businesses in most towns in America still, still see themselves that way. Yeah. Right. You have, you have owner X and, you know, she has a business, but she's also in the local Kiwanis club. She's on the PTA herself. She goes to high school football games. So her presence in her business, you know, she's sponsoring the local little league club. She's a member of the community. So, so, so her, her customers or clients are people that she sees in the grocery store. She sees them at church. She sees them right at, yep. at uh, well, little he, league, he but is their decisions. Absolutely. But if you're, if you are in this sort of multinational company headquartered in Germany, and you're one of 500 branches across the planet earth, you're not a member of a community. You're a member of the corp. Yeah. You're a number on a balance sheet. And Absolutely. So when you, when we've got a cost cut. Boom. Detroit yeah. closed. Right. Milwaukee so, branch closed. Exactly. So, so essentially what happens is all of those incentive structures completely change and you get, you, you swap out the incentive structures to maintain, right to maintain good standing in the corporation yeah. uh, versus maintaining good standing in your community. Yeah. And, and as, as America's economy exploded after World War II, um, as we became more international in terms of, of business opportunities, uh, we, we were really right on this growth curve on the leverage curve on the expanding market curve on the curve that, that responded to shareholder value. The good part is that we became a very wealthy country. The, the other side of that coin, right? Sort of the, the negative externalities is greater alienation yes. and, and greater disconnection. Now, I, I, am, I am not a Marxist. I wanna say this for the record. <laughs> uh, but, but when the Marxists talk about that when the socialists mentioned that in the 19th century in terms of the consequence of capitalism that is it, it tends to depersonalize and, and sort of tends to alienation they weren't entirely wrong about about that yeah right. well that's why i think today you're seeing this this emerging conversation around conscious capitalism or um patient uh capitalism or new capitalism just rec recognizing that like something happened in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, where several things occurred, right? There was the mass consolidation of businesses, globalization. So the negative externalities of that, you've got, you've got big business, big banks that are highly efficient, highly profitable, but people are reduced to statistics, balance sheet numbers. Uh, you also have economists like, you know, one, one of the ones we point to a lot is Milton Friedman in the 1970s wrote a piece on that the, the purpose of business is to maximize shareholder return, right? Mm -hmm. and so that becomes like almost law. And we kind of latch onto that written into policy. This, ideolo this ideology now becomes a driver in business and how we think about markets. And it's, and it's taken a couple of decades to kind of deconstruct that a little bit and to kind of, wait a minute, let's, profit's not the enemy, but how we make profit, how we think about people, which goes back to what you started off with, which is at the end of the day, it's all about connection. It's all about the person. It's all about where are you in community and do you know the people you're working with and in your community and how are you affecting change in a local 
regional context. So, yeah, and and that, that's that's exactly right. So so Milton Friedman was was correct. I in in terms of it being one of the important variables, right? If your business is not profitable, it's a signal. Sure. That something's probably wrong, right? But it's not the only thing that matters. There are other things that matter. And, and I, I, would, I would say that what's happened in terms of the absence of virtue and in, 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 in terms of, of how we raise up and, and train business leaders, those additional virtues are often missing. And so the framework in terms of what really matters often obscures uh, the sorts of things that, that really lead to human flourishing locally that, that, that might undermine uh, some growth projections, but it's good for people. And, and the question is whether or not business leaders, owners, managers have permission mm -hmm. uh, to make some of those trade-offs. I mean, this is the advantage of being an entrepreneur is that if it's your own business, then you, you yourself have that freedom if you are part of a multinational, you don't necessarily have that freedom unless the multinational has that embedded uh, in, their, in their business model. Uh, so I, I think there's some real tensions with, you know, these sort of large multinationals, uh, the medium to small business, the sort of, and the, and the really, really small uh, businesses with, you know, 10 or less employees. Yeah. And in and, and one sense, the, the small businesses are much more free uh, to be, to be, uh, advocates of, of human dignity and, and human flourishing and thriving. And one of the big dangers that we're seeing on the horizon is because of the hyper consolidation of, of banks where a lot of the capital flows to support these businesses. These banks that you would have found in communities uh, have all been got uh, gobbled up. And so mm -hmm. having a sub $10 billion assets and management bank, which is small, uh, is really hard to find uh, because those are the bankers that are willing to look at a credit score, willing to consider alternative considerations in the decision making. Uh, but as those get consolidated into the, the big conglomerates, it makes it, it makes it very difficult for those, those local, local businesses. And so then it gets back to economics, get back to controlling the poor, uh, and, and it's really concerning on, on a connection and a community on a local level. So, you, you know, during, during Jim Crow and the uh, black community and, uh, in, in, th in those communities that had black owned banks, for example, the, the bankers, not, they, they, they not only knew their customers, but they knew other people to whom their customers were accountable to in mm -hmm. terms of, in, for, in terms of, uh, references and and credibility, right? So if you go in for a loan in 1955 in say Atlanta, or you need an insurance policy uh, in in Atlanta 1955, uh, you go to the sort of black owned black run institution, but then that person also knows your pastor. Uh, also knows the high school, the principal of the school where your kids are attending, things like that. And so, and so you can take greater risk on people because you know, you not only know them, but you know people who know them, mm -hmm. who can vouch for them. And, and those community banks, we, you know, you're right, we sort of lost those. And, and because of that, particularly for those who are working class and below, uh, they're the ones who benefited the most from having relationships with uh, uh decision makers in, in those contexts. Now, it wasn't perfect, right? Because sometimes bad decisions were made because sure. it was your cousin you yeah, know, who, gave, sure. who gave you the loan and you defaulted again. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a perfect. Uh, however, you saw different externalities uh, than you see uh, today. Well, and you look at just even, there's business lending, but there's also personal lending. And you look at just the economic crisis in 2008, and you look at the staggering statistics on personal lending and how it basically dried up or became fee-based. And so there was a new business model that emerged in the 90s, 2000s, quietly in banks that has just continued to ensnare the poor uh, and, and give them less and less opportunities. 
uh, as they look to to build a future for themselves. So it's it's really, really a, a tragedy. I think that mm-hmm. that needs to be addressed as we think about rebuilding families, and and addressing some of this uh, criminalization that we that we see. Sure, you know if you're if you're working class and and below, uh, and you're only known by your credit score, you're at a profound disadvantage. And that's a part of the depersonalization, the dehumanization, the alienation that we've arrived at today is that we see people according to numbers on, on, on spreadsheets, right? Uh, as opposed to seeing, seeing them as persons connected to other persons and yeah. interdependent on, on other persons. And so your credit score becomes the thing that people tell you to, to protect at all costs, right? You can't have bad credit, you can't have bad credit instead of wondering, well, what are we focused on, on people being virtuous humans and, and having morality <laughs> and caring about their neighbor? Uh, those are the sorts of things that also build your credit score, right? Yeah. And those, those reductions, as, as you said, have, have really not been uh, advantageous to those who are in, in the working class communities or, or below. Well, we're coming up on the end, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the work that you've done with the Galsworthy Fellowship. Um, I want to maybe explain a little bit about it, what it is, um, maybe some of the things that have come out of it. And I think you've been running it for a couple of years now. Um, And then I think to round it out, why do you think it's important that we continue to invest in the research of solutions around mass incarceration, rebuilding of families, um, as, as you've kind of talked about? So the um, Goldsworthy program is something that I've run here in New York at the King's College. And it's intended to introduce scholars to the range of issues that are related and and connected to mass incarceration. And I I, I wanted to do this in part for scholars because they're, they're the ones who teach undergraduate students and those undergraduate students are the ones who end up often being decision makers and influencers and leveraging uh, assets, uh, both socially and, and, and otherwise, in the marketplace, right? So I, I want people to sort of understand uh, the range of issues, particularly if they are in decision-making uh, uh, positions, and to introduce these scholars to what's happening on the ground. So, so it, it's really uh, uh, divided in, in two sectors. On the one hand, let's read the data see what it actually says. Uh, And then let's actually talk to practitioners and see what practitioners are doing on the ground and see where the gap is in in what the data is saying and what institutions are doing and what communities actually need. And how can new scholarship uh, really address the real gaps and real issues uh, that that uh, uh, people see, so I'm I'm an, an advocate of, of people really studying this issue closely. It's highly complicated, highly layered. You can't really be uh, a generalist on this, like healthcare, for example. It's just it's just really complicated. Lots and lots of layers there. But if you get the data wrong, if you get the story wrong, you get the solutions wrong. Mm. And so apart of my work, a large part of my work is helping people get the story right, as right as possible to to not focus on just one strain like the drug war, but also focus on race and class and poverty and geography and the family. Because insofar as we're able to see all of the variables that matter, all of the variables that, that make a contribution to this problem, guess what? We can be extremely creative with solutions. (laughs) <laughs> right? The more variables, the more solutions. The more solutions that we see, the more people we can draw into making a contribution to making this thing better. So one of the things I tell audiences is, is that when you look at all of the variables that affect why people are criminally deviant, there is not a single vocation in the marketplace that can't make a contribution to keeping somebody from having their that first interaction with the police. School teacher, uh, school nurse, bus driver, postal worker, uh, a business owner, doctor, lawyer, 
everybody can do what they can in their own lane, in their own sphere, to humanize someone in such a way that can make them whole and keep them whole. Uh, and, 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 and insofar as people believe themselves to be whole persons, they're less likely to find themselves breaking the social contract and being criminally deviant. Everybody has an opportunity to humanize someone else, to love them, to care about them, to invest in them. And that's how we, we solve this problem, sort of all hands on deck and not leave it just to the, to the professionals. I'm saying we're all professionals hmm. uh, in this area and can really do a lot of good things. And entrepreneurs, just wanna do a plug for that. Uh, entrepreneurs in particular uh, are probably among the most important because they're the ones that have the creativity to provide the economic opportunities that really form and stabilize and maintain families. Uh, so they are the ones that, I, that, that often are overlooked, but I believe they're actually, if not, well, not, not only among the, 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 uh, the most important, maybe I could say the most important <laughs> variable in undermining all these things <laughs> is is their freedom and creativity and opportunity to create sustainable employment for people in their local communities